All the sunshine and warm temperatures finally moving towards the east. We have one weak storm system now moving in across Northern California. Next, Roseanne Show, 1999 Daytime Emmy Nominee. Much more, so what can you expect? An unusual day. Mold, moderate side, low tree, grass, and weed count. Weekday. The Con nah, my so many. Asking you. Every up to date at the shooting at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, which is a suburb just to the south of Denver, Colorado. There is considerable chaos out there at the moment. As you look at our local station uh, in Denver now, uh, taking shots of a variety of SWAT teams in the area, moving in on the school, a story which is still clearly not by any shape of the imagination finished. The investigation into the high school massacre is slow moving and dangerous. The two gunmen who went on the rampage booby trapped the building and even themselves. Most of the bodies are still inside the school, but families of the murder victims have been notified. President Clinton saying he and his aides are struggling to understand why all of this happened. The president said early intervention is the key to preventing trouble. Around the country, we have seen so many of these incidents since the beginning of the 1990s. The enormous question is why. There is no apparent answer here yet. Too much chaos in a situation that is moving too rapidly. After nearly two years of scrupulous preparation, two high school students, who appear no other than ordinary to their family and peers, in Littleton, Colorado, ready to commit one of the greatest school atrocities that America has ever seen, the Columbine High School Massacre. Good evening, everyone. The reaction of so many people today was, oh, no, not again. Another high school. In just one hour, 15 people were dead and 24 others were injured. Countless numbers of Americans were glued to their television sets, watching the aftermath of the horrific events that had just occurred. Not only baffled as to what it all meant, but also as to how it exactly happened. That's right, at this hour we still do not know just how many bodies are still inside. The latest shooting incident that has shocked the nation. Police say two young men. We just kind of ran, we're running towards the cop cars. It's just really windy outside. I hear them screaming. Um, no gunshot, just threat. Why hadn't the United States seen anything like this occur? at any other educational institutions previously? Why were the events that transpired at Columbine so successful? What allowed the two perpetrators, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, to go about their plans with such little obstacle? Multiple news stations gathered around the disordered campus, analyzing nearby evidence and interviewing first-hand witnesses, hoping to receive the answers to all of these questions. People were getting shot all around me. <laughs> there was a guy at a table right next to us, next to me and her, and they just shot him, and then walked away, and then he was just sitting there in a pool of blood. A number of witnesses recognized the two as members of a group called the Trench Coat Mafia. They always wear black clothing or dark clothing, glasses, berets. They get, they get made fun not of. A lot, a lot of kids like them. Yeah. I just keep thinking that this does not happen at our school and that I'm going to wake up and this is going to be over. Because, God, not at Columbine, you know? It happens in some other school somewhere else. It doesn't happen here. As we look back at the tragic event, long after it has been permanently imprinted into the dark side of American culture, it is much easier to get a better idea of why and how the ordeal was as devastating as it turned out to be as opposed to trying to find the answers to these questions on that fateful day. By looking at the circumstances that were formed from incidents which occurred before and during the massacre, as well as studying the aftermath of the event and its consequences on modern society, we can formulate a much more apparent explanation for how Columbine happened and why it continues to have such a negative influence on the world today. Before we go into detail about how exactly Columbine happened and how it became as devastating as it turned out to be, it is first important to understand why the event was so impactful on the American psyche to begin with. This entire incident caused many people to pose the very same question. Why was Columbine the first of its kind? Why had nothing like this ever been seen before? 
Why did it happen now rather than earlier? Well, in order to answer these questions, it is important to know that this notion that nothing like this had occurred before Columbine is not exactly true. ABC Television News now presents a special program on today's mass murder in the capital city. And a human rampage spreads death and terror across the University of Texas campus. Men, women, children, all are targets. The crazed sniper sends bodies crumpling to the ground everywhere for over an hour. One afternoon's tragic total, 16 dead, 33 wounded. One of history's worst mass murders occurred here in Austin today. Charles J. Whitman. He was identified by police as the sniper. He was shot down on the observation deck by two city policemen. By Over a dozen night, lives were taken under the fire of a man fire, on top of the bell tower at the University of Texas. It, it is classified by most historians to be the very first mass school shooting in modern U.S. history. The shooter, Charles Whitman, woke up in the middle of the night and killed his wife and his mother. That very same day, Whitman went to the top of the University of Texas Tower and killed 15 people. In October of 1991, a shooting at a Luby's cafeteria in Killing, Texas claimed the lives of 24 people, much more than Columbine. At the time, it was the deadliest mass shooting that had ever occurred in the United States. In March of 1998, five people were killed by two gunmen at a middle school in Arkansas. Understanding that Columbine was not the first modern American mass shooting in a school, or one of its immensity, does make things much clearer but it still leaves one of these questions unanswered. Why Columbine? Occurrences like the shooting at the University of Texas and Luby's massacre killed many more people than Columbine did. And although people who are well informed with the United States history may be aware of them, these events do not have the same amount of notoriety. Unlike these incidents, why is Columbine the one that seems to be present in the everyday American consciousness? Despite the severity of these two events and the similarities of the one that occurred in Arkansas to Columbine, these three events relatively all share one thing in common. The perpetrators left little to no information behind as to exactly how and why they did it. After an autopsy report was performed on Charles Whitman, it was determined that a tumor had formed in the white matter part of his brain. It is believed that this tumor was the cause of the shooting, as it was presumably responsible for Whitman's violent tendencies, which he had developed many years prior. He even mentioned in his suicide note that he wanted to seek help for his mental illness, which he self-diagnosed. Whitman had also purchased the majority of his weapons at Sears the same day as the attack. With this small amount of information in mind, it can be inferred that his tendency to kill was essentially out of his control, an act of compulsion over anything else. The shooter at Luby's cafeteria never officially explained what his motives were. It is theorized that his actions were motivated by a disdain that he had towards women and carried out his attack as an act of revenge. Although, so little evidence that pointed to why he did it was recovered that this can really only be theorized. The two gunmen who killed five people at Westside Middle School in 1998 allegedly did it after a breakup with a girlfriend, but no motives were definitively confirmed. Similar to Whitman, the two gathered all of their weapons and supplies less than 24 hours before the shooting. It is as if their attacks were significantly influenced by impulsiveness. This is not to say that these perpetrators did not have any forethought for their actions whatsoever. The perpetrator of Luby's cafeteria began preparation approximately eight months before committing his atrocities, just not to the degree that Eric and Dylan had. With each of these cases, 
lack of information on their preparation suggests the perpetrator either carried the attack out on impulse and with a lack of premeditation or just leave the event itself an overall mystery, making our understanding of it much more obscure and thus making it less likely to be studied. With Eric and Dylan on the other hand, the amount of evidence and the manifestos that these two left behind broadens the perspective of the entire event significantly. Not only was there a motive left behind, but one that is so much more complex than usual and one which shows that their reasons for carrying out the massacre were not solely an act of revenge, but also led by a desire to kill. Their acts were not committed last minute to cope a sudden urge. They were long thought out, meticulous, and deliberate. Something America had never seen before. I had to go through so many, so many um, phases of accepting this and accepting, okay, they were there and okay, they hurt people and it was purposeful and yes, it was planned, it wasn't impulsiveness. When I thought of that and thought of the magnitude, I was, I really didn't think I was going to live through it. As previously mentioned, Columbine is also studied for what it wanted to be, not just for what it became. Eric and Dylan did not just want to project violence onto people that wronged them but they wanted to create a tragedy that was so horrific that it would be the first of its kind. A tragedy that was anticipated to accumulate more deaths than the Oklahoma City bombings that happened almost exactly four years before. Based on the transcripts from the basement tapes, it is theorized that the attack was originally planned for April 19th, the anniversary of these bombings. It is unclear as to why the date was changed to the 20th, although it is believed that Eric needed to receive more ammunition from Mark Maines, who was unable to deliver it until their desired date, as opposed to Sunday night, the 18th, as originally planned. No, Columbine was by no means the first mass shooting, nor was it the deadliest of its time, but it was the first to conceptualize that average teenage students in an average town in the middle of the United States could have these capabilities. It is this that made Columbine so infamous and is why it continues to stay in the minds of many people 20 years later. The early hours of Tuesday, April 20th, 1999, are not inherently all that interesting for the average American citizen. A volcano in Alaska had erupted the day before. More US troops are entering Albania, and President Clinton's request of $6 billion to continue the air campaign for the Balkans war is considered front page news. Uh, we do believe that it is important to keep the refugees in the region so that they can in fact go home. What we all prefer, all the countries involved in this, is to try to keep uh, the refugees in as close as possible to the region. For those living in the suburbs of Denver, Colorado, it is nothing more than a typical cold, dry, beautiful spring morning. Although for Eric and Dylan, they know that this is going to be a day where they will officially carry out their plans for mass destruction. It is just two and a half weeks before high school graduation, and also the day which will drastically change the course of American history. It is approximately five o'clock in the morning. Eric is packing up his ammunition, which he retrieved from Mark Maines the previous night. Dylan is also gathering weapons that they intend to use in the attack. With a lot planned, he is awake much earlier than usual and in a bit of a rush to meet with Eric. It was dark. And it wasn't time to wake up Dylan yet, but I heard him bounding down the stairs, big heavy footsteps. And I thought, what's he doing up so early? 
And I opened my bedroom door. All the lights were out. The house was pitch black. And I yelled, Dill? And I heard the front door slam. And he said, bye. And that was the last time I heard his voice. After Dylan's brief interaction with his mother, him and Eric arrive at the AMF Bellevue bowling alley. Although they briefly chat with one of their classmates in the parking lot, they never actually set foot inside the building. They completely skip their zero hour bowling class scheduled for six o'clock. According to their teacher, Christine McCauley, this was very unusual behavior as they had always attended class in a timely manner. It is not exactly known why Eric and Dylan visited the bowling alley without actually going to class, although it is believed that they likely visited to say goodbye to some of their bowling classmates. They then make a visit to the grocery store to purchase three of the eight propane tanks they intend to use for their bombs. Although they had purchased their first two propane tanks at a hardware store the weekend before for around $300, they buy most of these tanks in bulk on the morning of MBK. They plan to use two propane tanks for the cafeteria, two for each of their cars, and two as booby traps outside of the school. Sometime between 5 and 11 a.m., each of these two bombs are planted about three miles outside of Columbine High School and about two miles away from the local fire station. Both of these bombs were set to detonate at 11.14 a.m., three minutes before the bombs in the cafeteria were to go off. These bombs outside the school were to be used as a diversion for Jefferson County police and firefighters with the hopes that authorities would be inspecting this area and within far proximity from the school. At around 7 a.m., the two go to Eric's house and then go their own ways to set up their supplies. Eric goes to fill some of their propane tanks while Dylan leaves to fill up on gasoline. They will spend the next 90 minutes setting up the cafeteria in car bombs and practicing the event with their firearms. At approximately 8.36 a.m., Eric purchases two more propane tanks at a Conoco gas station. Just about 35 minutes later, he makes his final propane tank transaction at a Texaco gas station about three miles away. The surveillance video shown will be the last footage seen of Eric publicly before he enters Columbine for the attack. Shortly after setting up their propane tanks and gathering their weapons, Eric and Dylan go to eat breakfast. They will spend the rest of this time recreationally until about 10.30 a.m. where they will return to Eric's house to prepare everything for Columbine's eight lunch hour, the busiest time of day in the school cafeteria. At around 10.45, they create their final basement tape. They are in Eric's living room. Dylan is the first one to appear on screen with Eric behind the camera. He's wearing a Boston Red Sox baseball cap, an untucked plaid shirt and military boots. Several duffel bags are surrounding him. Dylan says goodbye to his mother and apologizes in advance for what they are about to commit. Eric then appears on screen and Dylan takes over filming. He is wearing the same plaid shirt with a white t-shirt under it. He also apologizes to his parents and everyone that he loves, claiming that his decisions are beyond their control. They then both tell each of their friends that they can have their belongings after the massacre takes place. The tape ends with a drawing on Eric's wall, depicting the initials for Columbine High School near a drawing of a lighted bomb with the word clue written in large, bold letters.
bringing all of their available equipment with them. They both take separate cars to Columbine High School. During the time of a lunch, the school surveillance tapes were reportedly switched by a custodian during the time that Eric and Dylan were dropping off the bomb filled duffel bags in the cafeteria, which means that no definitive footage of them setting up these explosives exists. Although, this claim has been disputed. The tapes may have been switched just at the right time to catch the two in the act. It is widely believed that they actually planted the bombs at precisely 1058, where they can be seen across each of the cameras. They are wearing the flannel shirts described in the final basement tape transcripts, and they do appear to be carrying duffel bags. It is apparent that they are dressed quite casually, likely to blend in with the other students. Based on their body language, they also do seem to be going about their operation in quite a discreet way, as well as showing some resemblance to the way that Eric and Dylan walk in other videos. With this information at hand, it is likely that they set up the bombs in the cafeteria at the displayed time approximately 19 minutes before they are set to go off. According to the schedule which they placed in their journals, Eric and Dylan presumably then set off to Clement Park, about half a mile away from the school, to officially gather all of their weapons together. They change into the outfits that they will wear during the attack. Dylan has on a black t-shirt, which reads the word WRATH, in big red letters. Eric is wearing a homemade bandolier over a white t-shirt with the words natural selection printed on it. Over these, both are wearing long black trench coats, seemingly wearing the same pants and military boots which they wore in their final basement tape recording. At around 11.10, they return to the school fully geared up. Eric arrives at the junior student parking lot near the south entrance of the campus, whereas Dylan parks near the west entrance in the senior student parking lot. Each of the bombs in their cars are set to explode at exactly 12 p.m. One of the few people that notices their absence is Brooks Brown. That very same day, he and Eric had a very important exam in their philosophy class. Although Eric would skip class occasionally, he was overall quite studious with his grades and more careful about getting into class on time. Skipping school on the day of a big test was very out of the ordinary. While Eric is unloading the duffel bags of weaponry which he geared at the park, he encounters Brooks who is outside of the building having a cigarette. Brooks confronts him about missing the exam, which Eric responds, it doesn't matter anymore, Brooks. I like you now. Get out of here, go home. With Brooks already planning to skip his next class, he listens to what Eric told him. The reason as to why Eric chose to spare Brooks' life is a complete mystery. It can be inferred that his hate for Brooks was a huge component involved in his drive to mass murder to begin with, as evident by his web pages. So the fact that Eric did not kill him continues to baffle many people. While there are no definite answers for why he did this, there are some possible explanations. What are they? Well, one of them involves his and Brooks reconciliation. In January, about three months prior, the two had finally made amends, putting an end, for the most part, to this long period of acrimony. Although they still weren't as close friends as they were initially, their relationship was still better than it was in the midst of all the fighting that was going on, and still made a recovery. This would explain why Eric and Dylan met with Brooks and Becca Hines at a McDonald's the previous day. Perhaps Eric now saw Brooks in a different light, and rather going with his original plans, wanted to respect that truce. 
Brooks's mother, on the other hand, disagrees. She believes that Eric did not have any regard for the restoration of their peace, but instead spared his life solely out of the interest of his plans. He knew that killing Brooks out in the open would compromise the success of MBK. If this is indeed the case, Eric's decision to not kill one of his greatest arch enemies was not a sign of reluctance to go about his thoroughly organized attack, but rather a sign of something much more disturbing. Because the surveillance tapes were switched at 11.14, immediately after Eric had his conversation with Brooks, it isn't exactly known what Eric and Dylan were doing between this time and 11.17, the time the bombs in the cafeteria were meant to detonate. Those who believe that they were planting their bombs during the tape switch, as opposed to at 10.58, believe that they were carrying the duffel bags filled with the pipe bombs into the cafeteria to be planted, with only about two minutes to spare. These would be the duffel bags that were seen when Eric was telling Brooks to leave. If this is the case, then that means that Eric and Dylan never took an earlier stop at the school, but rather made their first stop with incredibly little time left, going to Clement Park to set things up right before. For those who believe that they did in fact plant these bombs at 10.58, these duffel bags would be used to unpack some of the recently geared up guns. One of these bags contained the shotgun that Eric would use during the massacre. Because of the circumstances of these incidents, the events that would transpire within these three minutes are relatively blurred, with only educated guesses made from evidence and witness accounts to fill in the gaps. Eric and Dylan then sit in their cars, waiting for the explosions and for NBK to officially be conceived. But even with their years of experience, studying the science of explosives, learning to effectively create their bombs, and learning to maximize their potential to cause devastating destruction, the results went against all odds. And nothing happened. It is as if multiple preternatural malfunctions occurred that prevented these bombs, scheduled for detonation at statistically the busiest time of day in the cafeteria, from ever exploding, saving approximately 500 lives. Columbine wasn't really intended as a school shooting. It was primarily intended as a bombing. They were inspired by the Oklahoma City bombing. They hoped they would kill as many as 500 people. In the end, a lot of their homemade bombs did not detonate. The most critical part of their diabolical plan was put to a stop by a miracle. Or was it? Regardless of the bountiful skills and knowledge that they had accumulated since the first day of their preparation, the reasons for why these bombs did not go off can still be attributed to Eric and Dylan's incompetence. They did have the years of experience, but in all of the wrong areas. If we refer back to Eric's website, it can be seen that their biggest reference for creating their explosives came from a 1971 manual known as the Anarchist Cookbook. This book was not considered a reliable source of information for creating bombs, and allegedly had many inconsistencies in its instructions. Since Eric and Dylan based their knowledge and relied most, if not all of their work, on only this manual, this would mean that they created a series of bombs that had these exact faults deeply handcrafted into them. One of the biggest flaws present in these bombs involved using plastic instead of conductive metal for some of the components. Although, this was not the only ingredient that prevented disaster. Even if Eric and Dylan had not used plastic parts like the cookbook had advised them, the recipes they used to initially build the bombs would have yielded an explosion far too weak 
to cause catastrophic conditions and the fire that it would have produced would have been quickly put out by the building sprinkler system. This was the case with one of the bombs located in the cafeteria that exploded after forced detonation. One of the field bombs that did partially go off created nothing more than a small fire, which naturally burned out before the propane tank exploded. It was much more difficult for them to test the type of bombs that they specifically created for the cafeteria, as these explosions were expected to be powerful enough to take down the second story of the school. It would be far too conspicuous to test bombs this strong. Therefore, Eric and Dylan just decided to create and plant them by trusting their knowledge and the steps that they followed from their research. They never had the opportunity to correct the faults present in their bomb making procedures. It was not a miraculous malfunction which stopped the bombings, but instead their overconfidence and lack of accurate knowledge. At 11.19 a.m., Jefferson County Dispatch Center receives a 911 call reporting a small fire coming from a pipe bomb located on Wadsworth Boulevard. Attention South, yeah, it's a report of a, what appears to be an explosion, it sounded like an explosion. Northbound on Wadsworth between Chatfield and Ken Carroll, the fire department's been advised. This was one of the diversion bombs that was planted just hours before. Creating a distraction from the school will give Eric and Dylan more time to carry out their plans. At the same time that these events are occurring, Eric and Dylan get out of their cars and carry two duffel bags and a backpack containing their firearms and head towards the west entrance steps, which will allow them to be located directly above the entrance to the cafeteria. Meanwhile, students Rachel Scott and Richard Costaldo are having lunch together outside the school. Richard is a relatively new student. He has just transferred from Catholic Matchabuff High School. He and Rachel have been recently having lunch together and have chosen to eat outside to admire the spring weather. They are sitting at the grassy knoll by the west entrance, located in the very same direction that Eric and Dylan are heading. The pipe bombs are now two minutes overdue. Knowing that their bombs have now failed to detonate, Eric and Dylan are now beginning to switch gears with how they are going to approach their anticipated assault on the school. With the most important part of their attack going awry, the two abandon all plans and begin to shoot at random. With Columbine approaching the end of the school year, Richard assumes that this is merely a senior prank and is not alarmed by his surroundings, giving Eric and Dylan the opportunity to take action. Eric uses his carbine to shoot Rachel three times. Richard is shot eight times in the spine, chest, and abdomen. He is now paralyzed from the waist down and shortly before losing consciousness, hears the cries of Rachel next to him. Eric then shoots her for the fourth time in the left temple. She is killed instantly. Eric drops his trench coat to the floor, leaving it by the stairs and reloads his rifle. Other classmates, Lance Kirkland, Daniel Rorbo and Sean Graves are on their way outside carrying some food. They are heading towards Clement Park to go smoke some cigarettes and to eat their lunch. This is the same park that Eric and Dylan were at earlier assembling their weaponry. Because they exit the cafeteria through the side entrance, they are unfortunate enough to be within 12 foot proximity of Eric and Dylan. Like Richard Costaldo, the three think that this is nothing more than a gag on the school and that the two were shooting their targets with paintball guns. They become the gunmen's next victims. 
Daniel is shot in the chest, leg, and abdomen. Lance tries to catch Daniel, but he too is shot in the leg and chest, losing his grip and falling to the ground. Daniel falls forward on his stomach onto the pavement. As Sean runs away from the scene, he is shot three times in the abdomen, but luckily is still able to make it to the cafeteria door before falling to the floor. Sean did not feel the bullets hit him, so he assumes that the two were shooting tranquilizers. After getting temporary help from a woman inside the building who fled the scene as the gunshots got closer, Sean is left behind. Among other students who were sitting outside near the west entrance that are running away from the scene is Michael Johnson. Michael is shot, but able to take cover in the athletic storage shed with the other students who remained uninjured. Mark Taylor is outside having a religious discussion with some of his friends who are waiting for the cafeteria line to get shorter. Upon seeing Eric and Dylan, he and his friends also think that they are carrying paintball guns. Mark immediately fell to the ground after he was first shot. He tries his best to get out of Eric and Dylan's sight, but is shot four more times. He is left to play dead with a collapsed lung and a bullet lodged into his spinal cord just millimeters from hitting his aorta and vital organs. Like Rachel Scott and Richard Costaldo, Anne Hockelter and her friends were also having lunch on the grassy hilltop when the shooting began. While running away from the scene, she is shot in the back and chest by Eric, injuring her spinal cord. She immediately falls to the floor. Eric and Dylan make unsuccessful attempts at shooting people out on the soccer field several yards away. They also throw some of their pipe bombs on the roof of the school just down the parking lot. In the school library, Peggy Dodd, a technology teacher, looks out the window and sees Dylan shooting on the hill. Peggy recognized him right away, as Dylan was a student in her class during his junior year, and according to her, had reportedly been a troublemaker who hacked into computers and wore tall Nazi boots and an overcoat. Her description of his appearance could refer to the black trench coat and military boots that Dylan is actively wearing in the shooting, as this was not the first time that Eric and Dylan had shown up to school wearing their trench coats. Eric and Dylan head back near the outside stairway. Lance is still laying on the floor injured next to his friend Daniel. Eric walks towards Daniel and shoots him one last time. He succumbs to his injuries and dies shortly after. Dylan then slowly approaches Lance and shoots him point blank range in the face. He then loses consciousness. I, I was walking out and the uh, first sight I thought it was a scene of Hank, but then I realized it was real. And at that point, I was already shot. Um, I think it's really dumb that those kids are able to lie through the vents. And it's scary, in a way. Dylan is right outside the west entrance. Sean has rubbed the blood from his wounds onto his face and is playing dead in this area of the school. Dylan says, sorry dude, as he walks over his injured body. Dylan then briefly enters the cafeteria, officials assume, to check on the propane bombs that failed to explode. In an unusual set of circumstances, he does not shoot anyone in sight. The cafeteria is still relatively busy, as only right now are people inside the school starting to notice that some sort of commotion is happening outside. Jefferson County Officer Neil Gardner is overlooking the school, having lunch in his patrol car, when he receives a phone call by a school custodian about reports of gunshots being fired on campus. He is asked to meet with other Columbine staff in the student parking lot. Approximately one minute later, the very first 911 call is made from the school, reporting the injuries of Anne Hawkhalter, stating that she may be paralyzed. This information is forwarded to Deputy Paul Magger, 
who is on his way to inspect the mini explosion that occurred at Wadsworth, three miles from the school. Gardner hears the report over his police radio and heads back towards the main campus, putting on his police sirens. Students inside the school are still confused as to what exactly is going on. A female student runs into the cafeteria, screaming that someone is shooting outside. Other students begin to panic and run out of the commons. One of these students is 18-year-old Nicholas Foss, who runs outside the building. He encounters the body of Daniel Rorbo and the injured Lance Kirkland lying on the floor, who reportedly has half of his face missing. Eric and Dylan are at the top of the stairs, shooting down at the people outside. One of these bullets grazes past Nick, only centimeters from hitting his head. He and other students and faculty members take sanctuary in a bathroom inside the teacher's lounge. Students in the cafeteria are now aware of the dangers occurring on school grounds, but many of them are still inside, taking refuge underneath the lunch tables. Eric and Dylan are now heading in this direction, an invitation to disaster. It is the high school gym teacher, Dave Sanders, and two other custodians, John Curtis and Jay Gallantine, who begin to alert students about the gunfire outside and divert them away from the cafeteria. While some students remain under the tables, most are able to get out safely, panicking as they head towards the east exits of the commons, leaving behind their school supplies. While all of this is happening, Deputy Paul Smoker is patrolling West Bulls Avenue just one mile north of the school. He reports to the campus when he is radioed about Hawk Helter's injuries. 35-year-old Patty Nielsen is working as a substitute teacher for Columbine's Art of the World class and as today's hall monitor. She notices one of the students at the end of the hallway holding a gun. With another nearby student, Brian Anderson, they investigate the area and go over to confront them, assuming that they were just shooting a movie. Brian had clarified to Patty that Eric was in his video production class. Eric notices Patty and Brian enter the first set of doors in the passway. He smiles and shoots, missing and instead hitting the glass doors behind them. Patty was hit by the shrapnel, which resulted from the blast. She began to scream and run away from the scene, realizing what was happening was not a joke. Brian Anderson, running behind her, is shot in the back. Deputy Gardner is currently in the senior parking lot. He is shot at by Eric 10 times immediately after exiting his vehicle. He fires back four shots, Noticing Eric make an abrupt turn to the right, he thinks for a moment that he has successfully shot him, but realizes that Eric was only reloading. He gets back into position and continues shooting a gardener, but only hits two vehicles parked close by. Eric briefly hides in the school's entrance. Despite Brian and Patty both battling injuries, they are able to make it to the library safely. The school's library will be where most of the shooting will take place. Even during lunchtime, the library is still a popular hangout for many students who are finishing schoolwork or even spending time recreationally. This would mean that the library is still fairly populated, despite the cafeteria reaching its busiest time just a few minutes ago. One of the students sitting in the back of the library is 15-year-old Amanda Stair. She is sitting by the library's back window, enjoying the view of the Rocky Mountains and reading the local newspaper. She, along with many other students, begin to hear gunshots ring throughout the school. Assuming that they are just the sounds of firecrackers after brief investigating, they pay no mind to the noise and continue to do their work. Patty and Brian then enter the library shortly after, shouting to everyone that a student is carrying a gun. Librarian Liz Keating, along with another teacher, advise everyone to evacuate to another area, 
although Patty can hear the gunman heading towards the pathway to the second floor of the building. Students exiting the library would easily be within shooting proximity of Eric and Dylan, so Patty tells everyone to instead stay where they are and hide under the tables. Students are initially reluctant to following her instructions. Like many others, they assume that this is all part of some practical joke or senior prank. It is not until Patty reiterates to them to get down that they realize the severity of the situation. Around this same time, more deputies arrive on the west side of the campus, attending to some of the students who were injured on the field. More gunfire is exchanged between the police and Eric, who is hiding behind the west entrance windows. This ends after a short period of time, and he returns to the north hallway with Dylan. The sounds of gunshots continue to radiate from the building as people run outside. Students who are not part of a lunch are not aware of what is going on outside. It is not until Eric and Dylan run by the halls, firing their weapons and laughing as bullets hit the lockers and walls, that students in classrooms begin to prepare for lockdown and flee for safety. Students Stephanie Munson and Melissa Walker run out of their tech classroom and try to escape through the north hallway with other students, only to encounter the gunman. Stephanie is shot in the ankle by Dylan, but both girls are able to make it out safely to Leewood Park, just across the street from the school. Dave Sanders heads towards the second floor of the school after clearing out the cafeteria, ordering Peggy Dodd and other people to stay where they are. It is at this time where he encounters Eric and Dylan in the hallway. He attempts to retreat back to the cafeteria, but is shot in the neck by Eric. Richard Long helps Dave enter a science classroom for safety. Students Aaron Hansey and Kevin Starkey aid to Dave's neck wound while other students call for medical assistance. Back in the library, Patty runs to the circulation desk and dials 911, while Brian Anderson, Peggy Dodd, and a few other students hide in the storage closet. There are a total of four staff members and 55 students in the library. The 911 call that Patty makes will be the most infamous phone call of the whole ordeal. Eric and Dylan approach the library entrance as the call is taking place. About three and a half minutes in, their voices can be heard in the background. Student Evan Todd is hiding behind one of the library support pillars near the copy counter. Walking by after throwing a lit pipe bomb, Eric spots him and fires his gun. Evan is able to duck from the bullet darting towards him. Seeing his unsuccessful attempt, Eric fires a second shot. Evan is injured by the flying debris of splintered wood, which resulted from Eric's bullet hitting the counter. They are now visible to the students inside. Realizing that she would be visible from both sides of the library, Amanda Stair moves over from the back of the library to the long computer tables. She recognizes that Dylan is wearing his trench coat. Amanda's brother, Joe Stair, is one of the founders of the trench coat mafia so she believes that her brother may know one of the shooters. After throwing a pipe bomb right outside the entrance, they officially enter the library, shouting to the students to get up from the tables. Other witness accounts state that the shooters also demand all students who played a sport to stand up as well. In order to find a better hiding spot, Patty moves to another area of the room leaving the phone and the 911 dispatcher behind. The rest of the call will capture the audio of the entire library massacre. Jefferson County 911. Yes, I am a teacher called by high school. There is a student here with a gun. He has shot out a window. I believe one of them has shot. I've been called by high school. I don't know what's in my shoulder. If it was just a last minute, what? Okay, has anybody been injured, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
and the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got students down out of the table, kids. Heads under the table. Um, kids are screaming. Some of the teachers um, are, you know, trying to take control of things. We need police here. We need okay, police. we're getting them there. Please, yes, Who is the student, ma'am? I do not know who the student is. Okay. I saw a student outside. I was in hold and hold gun. Okay. I was on hold and I saw a gun. I said, what's going on out there? And he said, oh, it's probably for video production. It's probably a joke. I said, well, I don't think that's a good idea. And I went walking outside. I think he was dancing. See what was going on. And he turned the gun straight at us and shot. And my God, the window went out. And the kid standing there with me, I think he got hit. Okay. Something in my shoulder. Okay. We've got help on the way, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Oh, God. Stay in the line with me. Oh, God. Do, do we know where he's at? I'm sorry? Do we know where he's at? He, okay. I'm in the library. He's upstairs. He's right outside of here. He's outside? He's outside of this hall. Outside of a hall? Outside in the hall. Outside. Okay. There are alarms and things going off. Now smoke. My God, smoke is like coming into this room. Okay. okay. I've got the kids under the table here. I don't know what's happening in the rest okay. of the building. Most of like smoke in the building. I don't know. I'm sure someone has to be calling 911 to Yes. We've got a lot of people on. Okay. I just want you to stay in the line with me. Like we need to know what's going on. Okay. Okay. I am on the floor. Okay. And you've okay. got the kids the there. Library. And I've got every student in this library on the floor. You better stay on the floor. Is there any way you can lock the doors? Um, smoke is coming in from out there, and I'm a little okay. afraid. The gun is right outside the library door. Okay. I don't think I'm going to go out there. Okay. You're okay. calling my high school. I got, I got three children. Okay. We got it. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to go to the door to shut the, the door, okay? I've got the kids on the floor. Um, I've got all the kids in the library on the floor. We have paramedics, we have fire, and we have police on route, okay, sir? Okay. Okay. Yes. This, I mean, Bye. he's, I, I don't know, this, I can't believe he's not out of bullets. He just keeps shooting and shooting and shooting. Okay. Yeah, we've got a police officer on scene. Him. I thought it was. Okay, just try and keep the kids in the library calm. Yeah. Is there any way you can block the door so no one can get in? I do, I do not. Okay. I, yeah, I guess I can try to go, but I mean, he's right outside that door. I'm afraid to go to the door. That's okay. That's where he is. I'm not okay. afraid to go there, okay? That's okay. Okay, I told the kids to get on the floor. I had to get under the table. All of the children are on the floor under the table. Um, um, yeah, they're all under the table. Okay. And, and as long as we can just try and keep... No one's saying a word. Okay, as long as we can keep everyone there as calm as we can. I hear some yelling out there going on right yeah, now. Yeah, we've got alarms going off now as well. Yeah, there's alarms. This room is filled with smoke. Okay. Okay. Keep everyone low to the floor. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's up. Okay. Everyone stay on the floor. Stay on the floor. Stay under the table. Okay. Um, I... I don't know. I it's okay. I know. Just I don't know. I didn't. I said, what? What is that kid got? He was outside at the time, and 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 um, I was on call duty. Oh God! And he's 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 like he's going woo woo woo. Mm -hmm. I know. Things are, are being shot off. I do not know who the student was. I don't even think I saw him. He's wearing black. He didn't look very large. Um, it's a male student. Um, he was out there shooting. It looked like he was climbing out and shooting. And somebody, I said, what is that? Mm -hmm. I said, what's going on out there? This guy kept that. It's probably their video production. You know, they do these videos. Right. And, and the kids, the thing, I said, well, that's not, you know, a play gun, a real gun. I was going out there to say no. Mm -hmm. And I went, well, I said, oh, my God, that was really close. That just, that was not okay. What's your name, ma'am? Patty? Okay. I have him in the library shooting at students with a lady that I have in the library on the phone. Okay, try and keep as many people down as we can. Okay. Do you know who he is? Okay. Okay. 
As this phone call is going on, Eric and Dylan approach the west windows of the building. Dylan encounters Kyle Velasquez, who is sitting at a nearby computer table, and shoots him in the back of the head. He is killed instantly. The two then proceed to place their backpacks on the computer tables adjacent to where Kyle was hiding. These backpacks are filled with ammunition and Molotov cocktails. They then set an ambush by the windows and shoot at the police officers, evacuating the students outside, though no one is injured during this exchange. Dylan then takes off his trench coat, right before taking his shotgun and shooting at a table close by. Patrick Ireland, Daniel Steepleton, and Mackay Hall are wounded as a result. Eric turns away from the window and shoots twice at the closest table. Stephen Kernow is shot in the neck, dying as a result of his injuries. Casey Rugseger is wounded in her hand and shoulder. Eric and Dylan then move to the south side of the library. Eric walks over to a computer table located in this area and hits the table's surface twice with his pump slug. Hiding underneath is Cassie Bernal. He then bends down and says, peekaboo, before shooting her with a mortal wound to the head. The recoil from his pump slug is so powerful that Eric breaks his nose as a result. His face is now completely covered in blood. He then turns to a nearby student, Brie Pascal, and proceeds to terrorize her, asking if she wants to die. He begins to laugh, saying that they plan to blow up the school. Dylan then notices Patrick Ireland briefly move out from under the table, shooting him twice in the head and once in the foot. Patrick falls unconscious. Eric then joins Dylan at another set of tables, where Matthew Ketcher, Isaiah Schulz, and Rachel Scott's brother, Greg Scott, are all hiding. The two notice Isaiah first, calling him a racial slur. Isaiah had allegedly had a conflict with one of the shooters just one year prior. He says to both of them that he just wants to go home and see his mother. This would be the very last thing that Isaiah would ever say. After an unsuccessful attempt by Dylan to pull him out from under the table, he is fatally shot in the heart by Eric. Dylan then shoots towards the side of this table, where Matthew Ketcher is then killed. Greg Scott would be left behind unharmed after playing dead in his friend's blood. Eric then throws a lit CO2 cartridge bomb towards the table where Patrick, Mackay, and Daniel are injured. Mackay is able to discreetly throw the bomb towards an empty part of the library. It detonates immediately after, leaving behind no casualties. They move over to the library's east side. Dylan fires bullets toward the nearby trophy case and library table. Mark Kinjan is wounded in the head and shoulders as a result. He then fires a single shot at the tables to his left, shooting Lisa Krutz, Valine Schnurr, and Lauren Townsend simultaneously. Using his Tech-9, he then fires nine more bullets, the last shot killing Lauren. Valine is now critically injured and begins crying for help. Eric then begins to terrorize her, asking her condescendingly if she believes in God. The entire incident is recorded by Patty's unattended 911 call. At approximately 11.32, the first set of news reporters arrived at the scene. Many reporters were actively in Colorado investigating the case surrounding John Bonet Ramsey, but the incidents occurring at Columbine divert their situation. 
many news trucks go as far as park on the grass in order to get the best coverage that they can. Eric then fires at the table behind him, hitting Gina Park. She is left with an injured knee, shoulder, and foot. Eric then moves to the next table, where Nicole Nolan and John Tomlin are hiding. He shoots both of them. John tries to escape from under the table, only to be shot again and ultimately killed by Dylan. They return to the table where Valine and Lisa are hiding after another student catches their attention. Because there is not enough room, Kelly Fleming is hiding behind the table rather than under it, leaving her out in the open. Eric spots her and shoots her in the back, killing her instantly. He then fires another shot, wounding the already deceased Lauren Townsend and Lisa Crudes a second time. They return to the center of the library, reloading their weapons once more. Eric recognizes one of the students hiding in this area. It is 18-year-old John Savage, who was on relatively good terms with Dylan. After giving it thought, Eric and Dylan decide not to kill him and tell him to run out of the library. John obliges, exiting the school through the cafeteria, running for his life. The two shooters resume their rampage. Eric fires his high point carbine at Daniel Mauser, wounding his ear and hand. Daniel retaliates by shoving a chair in front of him and grabbing his leg, attempting to restrain his ability to move. Eric fights back, by fatally shooting Daniel, close range, in the face. Eric and Dylan then move south, where they encounter Jennifer Doyle, Austin Eubanks, and Corey DePooter. They fire their guns at the three students, wounding Jennifer and Austin, and killing Corey. The gunmen move over to the administration desk, not far from where Patty Nielsen is hiding. Eric throws a Molotov cocktail towards the southwestern end of the library, though it does not detonate. They come across Evan Todd for a second time, who has moved to this side of the library after being injured. Pointing the gun at his face, Dylan begins to express his hate towards Jocks, asking Evan if he is one. He then asks him to give him one good reason why he shouldn't die. Evan impulsively responds, saying that he does not want to get into any trouble, which angers Dylan, who says that Evan has no idea what trouble really is. Evan tries to clarify himself and says that he never had a problem with them. Dylan ultimately decides that he will let Eric choose his fate. Luckily, Eric is not seemingly paying attention and instead just says, let's go to the commons. This exchange between Eric, Dylan, and Evan is very important as it provides additional insight to their already complex motives behind the shooting and also expresses the evolution of their feelings and their behavior as they commit these atrocities. Although Evan never had negative interactions with Eric and Dylan that were totally direct, they were direct enough for the two to have a dislike for him. This information feeds to the one of many narratives that Eric and Dylan carried out their attack to get revenge on their bullies. This is apparent particularly with Dylan's reiteration that he does not like jocks and just his general taunting towards Evan's appearance and integrity. Eric's response is evident that the two's excitement for killing has come to a gradual decline. They even had enough ammo to kill everyone inside the library, but just decided not to. Their rush to get downstairs to now the least populated area in the school and giving mercy to other students rather than to pursue their murderous opportunities shows a strong contrast in their feelings between the start of their rampage and now. At first, 
they were loudly cheering at the sight of explosions and expressed a desire to kill anyone who passed by. Now they are calm and they have lost their adrenaline and seemingly also lost their sense of reality. Eric's blood loss from his nose injury is also another factor as to why he appears incoherent and not as energetic as before. Instead, they are now focusing more on detonating the bombs in the cafeteria and just ending what they initially started, which is exactly what they plan to do next. Dylan shoots a television located in the library break room and then smashes a computer sitting directly on top of the counter where Patty Nielsen was hiding. The two then leave the library. In just seven minutes, 10 people were dead and 12 more were wounded. Eric and Dylan are now on their way to the commons, passing by the hall to the science area of the school. They look through many of the locked classroom doors, even making eye contact with the students inside. Although they had the weaponry to break the locks on these doors and to then use the people inside as their next targets, they choose not to, particularly because of their loss of excitement, their loss of general train of thought, and their urge to finish their attack in the way that they originally intended. They begin to throw more pipe bombs down to the cafeteria and in seemingly directionless areas, with one of these bombs detonating in an unoccupied storage room. They then tape a Molotov cocktail to the door of another storage room located just next to where the injured Dave Sanders and other students are hiding. Like the other bombs, the explosion created a small fire, which was able to be quickly put out after Eric and Dylan enter the commons. It is at 11.44 when both are visibly seen through school surveillance for the very first time since the start of the massacre. Eric kneels at the stairs and fires his carbine towards one of the 20 pound propane bombs that was due to explode 27 minutes ago. If executed correctly, they will be able to accomplish their initial plan of blowing up the school and killing everyone inside. However, Eric's attempt fails and the bomb does not go off. Dylan then walks over to it and tries to ignite it close up, but this also yields no results. They begin to casually drink from the cups that students left behind upon evacuating, while continuing their attempts to blow up the bombs by using other methods. Dylan ignites and throws an additional CO2 cartridge, hoping that this will catalyze an explosion with the propane in a way that they anticipated from the very start. Dylan's attempt causes a large explosion, powerful enough to break the cafeteria windows and ignite five of the school sprinklers. He and Eric head back upstairs about two minutes later. They assume that the bomb has detonated successfully. Although, the sprinklers were able to put out the flames before any damage could be done to the propane tank. Had the sprinklers not activated, it is presumed that the explosion caused by the propane tank would have been powerful enough to collapse the ceiling of the commons, bringing the entire library down to the first story of the building. In the meantime, they head to the offices located upstairs, firing aimlessly towards the ceiling as they head to the art hall. They again make eye contact with other students hiding in the classrooms and bathrooms and say that they are going to kill anyone in sight, but do not actually make any attempts to attack. About 10 minutes later, at 11.56 a.m., they return to the cafeteria, noticing that the bomb that they believed was successfully detonated did not actually cause much damage at all. Realizing that there is nothing else that they can do to ignite these bombs, they head back upstairs to the library at exactly 12 p.m., possibly to see their car bombs go off, and noon was the time that they were scheduled. By the time they are inside, they notice that the entire library has been evacuated 
aside from the deceased and some of the injured, including Lisa Kreutz and Patrick Ireland. Shortly after Eric and Dylan first visited the commons, those who survived quickly fled the building and went towards the patrol cars at the front of the school seeking safety. They begin to exchange more shots with the police. Like last time, no one involved is ever injured. Noticing that their car bombs did not go off according to plan, just like all of the other bombs they attempted to explode, Eric and Dylan now realize that their meticulously prepared attack, their judgment day, NBK, had finally been concluded. Good afternoon from CBS News. This is Newsbreak. Police say 14 people may be injured after shots, explosions, and a fire were reported at suburban Denver's Columbine High School. Police and emergency crews surrounded the school for several hours while the gunmen were still inside. Witnesses who managed to escape described the scene. And there's a kid with a trench coat and a shotgun throwing pipe bombs in the parking lot and then he shot a girl outside. And then he came into the cafeteria and you could hear like bombs and shotguns going off. And then he came into the library and shot everybody around me. Then put a gun to my head and said, as if we were all wanted to die, and, and he was going to kill us if we were of color, and if we had a hat, and if we were, if we were as played sports. Killed by best and right. Yeah, mass chaos. Okay. They pulled them down out of police cars from the back of the school to get them away from the school, and they set up a triage area here, I think, just to, to get the wounded as quickly as possible. Ambulances, police, media, and the SWAT team are all stationed outside the school. They have spent hours watching all the terrors go down, watching a day like never before. Although, authorities never actually enter the premises until 12.30 p.m., going through the west back entrance to the upper level of the school over 20 minutes after Eric and Dylan took their own lives. The two SWAT team units that were present did not enter the cafeteria until nearly an hour later. These circumstances led to great controversy, as many people thought that this time could have been spent to rescue both the injured and the surviving students who were still inside, potentially still in danger with the shooters. So why did it take police so long to enter the building? There were many aspects of this event that authorities needed to assess and understand before proceeding into the school. One reason the police could not enter until hours after the attack started was because of the lack of protocol. Police were only trained to contain a criminal situation, rather to get involved in it. Even if they did know the necessary procedures to set foot into the school, they did not believe that they had the necessary resources to stop the chaos that was occurring within. It was not until noon that the SWAT team was waiting outside fully equipped. Lack of searching also led to lack of information, which made the shooting appear much deadlier than it actually was. With an on-service air conditioning repairman hiding at the roof of the building, it was believed that there were as many as three to eight gunmen present at the school. This was not a situation that standard police could resolve on their own without drastically increasing the number of casualties. It was also declared that up to 25 students were dead at around 4 p.m. Although this was long after police had already entered the school, reports like these go to show just how little information authorities actually had and show that a concern for police safety was also one of the many reasons why authorities did not take immediate action. 
student Deidre Kusera tries to get the attention of the police in order to bring aid to the wounded Dave Sanders, holding up a whiteboard against the window explaining the situation. Still in the presence of other students hiding, Dave Sanders passes away approximately three hours after getting shot, shortly before police and medical help enter the school. The rest of the day would be spent rescuing surviving students still inside the building and searching for booby traps and pipe bombs that could be surreptitiously planted throughout the campus. At approximately 2.38 p.m., Patrick Ireland regains consciousness and goes to the nearest window of the library, which has been destroyed due to the fire exchange between police and the shooters. Even with part of his body paralyzed, he's able to get himself over the ledge. This allowed the SWAT team to move under and rescue him promptly. The entire incident is captured on national television. He is nicknamed the boy in the window. I want to begin by saying that Hillary and I are profoundly shocked and saddened by the tragedy today in Littleton. We don't know yet all the hows or whys of this tragedy. Perhaps we may never fully understand it. St. Paul reminds us that we all see things in this life through a glass darkly, that we only partly understand what is happening. I, I think I, I can't do better than what Patricia Holloway said, the, the commission chair, you know, if it can happen here, then surely people will recognize that they have to be alive to the possibility that it could occur in any community in America, and maybe that will help us to keep it from happening again. And give this thing a day or two for the facts to emerge, and then I'll, I'll try to have more to say to you. The whole ordeal only lasted less than one hour, but Columbine immediately became the deadliest high school shooting in American history. With the endless amounts of nationwide coverage that the event received, with the amount of details that were released showing all of the warning signs and plans that were physically documented, and the fact that it was a tragedy carried out by two people rather than one, introduced a new era of sensationalism and forever changed the general public's view of the American teenager. If two kids who were ostensibly raised by healthy families and lived in typical suburban towns had the capabilities to commit such havoc, what about the other potential copycat killers that are seemingly going unnoticed? One MIT study of more than 800 video game players found no basis in fact for an underlying fear expressed by parents during public hearings that video games lead to violence. Around 10 years before Columbine, a social epidemic began to rise in the United States, the war on video games. With the number of school shootings increasing with the popularity of violent video games throughout the 1990s, Many concerned parents put the two together and felt that there was a serious problem being recognized as a social norm right before their eyes. I think it's horrific that something like that is on the market and I think I would have been shocked even before Dunblane, obviously in context of Dunblane. I, I, I just think it really is horrific. When it was discovered that Eric was a frequent player of the game Doom, going as far as to upload levels onto his website and make references of the game across his pages. This took their suspicions even further. As you have already heard, members of the entertainment industry must also do their part. They and the rest of us cannot kid ourselves. Our children are being fed a dependable daily dose of violence, and it sells. Although, other people felt that there was no connection between the two. In fact, some even felt that video games were important for the youth in some ways, as it prepares them to deal with the real world and to accept the horrors that occur within it. He's going to be exposed to all sorts of things 
um, online, in books, in movies, um, that I'll never be able to control. So I feel like doom is one of the most benign. And it's a lot better than the six o'clock news in a lot of ways. The events at Columbine also further pushed the agenda for more gun control. Many argued that it was far too easy for someone, especially troubled minors like Eric and Dylan, to obtain such a large number of firearms. These weapons were no longer being used for their main purpose, self-defense. People now felt that the Second Amendment was antiquated, and with the technological growth in weapons, was doing more harm than good. This movement was arguably one of the most controversial of the late 20th century. Only one week after Columbine, a gun rally was held in Denver, hosted by Charlton Heston. Over 8,000 people showed up. All of us will do everything meaningful, everything we can do to prevent it, but each horrible act can't become an ax for opportunists to cleave the very Bill of Rights that binds us. When an isolated, terrible event occurs, our phones ring, demanding that the NRA explain the inexplicable. His decision to defend the right to bear arms at this time received very mixed and divided responses. Lots of people praised Heston. He was acknowledging that tragedies, which were inevitable, should not change the ideals of the Founding Fathers. Take freedom it is away. what formed I the Constitution of America. Words. For everyone within the sound of my voice, to hear and to heed, and especially for you, Mr. Gore. <laughs> From my cold, dead hands. Those in opposition felt that Heston's choices were extremely distasteful. The timing was awful, and he was using a tragedy as a political statement, interrupting the silence that was intended for mourning. On the same day as Heston's rally, gun control advocates protested right outside the NRA's convention center. In this crowd was Tom Mauser. In a letter that he had written to Heston, Mauser questioned why he canceled the large NRA convention, but not the rally, in respect to the victims, if he really did not feel any kind of responsibility for the attacks. I am here today because my son Daniel would want me to be here today. Yeah. Something is wrong in this country when a child can grab a gun Got, grab a gun so easily and shoot a bullet <laughs> into the middle of a child's face as my son experienced. Something is wrong. It is time to address this problem. Some hedge clippers and turpentine. Take a look at this. Other people blamed pop culture. The late 1990s saw a re-emergence in punk rock, an appreciation for black and white Victorian themed horror films, and other art forms that encouraged the development of mainstream goth culture. It was a new trend that was now very prevalent in adolescent teenagers. Immediately after the shooting, Joe Stair was briefly taken into police custody for questioning. The media had just learned that the shooters were part of his group called the Trenchcoat Mafia. Their dark colored clothing and aesthetic led the media to associate the gunmen with the typical goth teenager. Jennifer, you know, in this world of labels, young people who align themselves with gothic are speaking up and speaking out against the violence in Colorado. I don't believe in, in violence. I don't believe in shooting or killing people. It's a... Uh, it's just, maybe they're a mess up as kids or something, I don't know. It, it really, it's a hard thing to say. This created many paranoid parents. 
What was the belief system behind the goth subculture? How was it teaching kids to behave? Who was responsible? Who was poisoning America's youth? In the dope show. Marilyn Manson was soon to be the center of heated debate for his alleged responsibility for the rise of troubled youth. Many adults pictured him as the heart of the goth lifestyle, as Columbine occurred during the peak of his popularity. I'm white trash all the way. Lots of parents saw him as a bad influence and encouraged his music to be taken off the radio and his face removed from the TV screen. Some will be so brash to ask if we believe that all who hear Manson tomorrow night will go out and commit violent acts. The answer is no. But does everybody who, who watches a Lexus ad go and buy a Lexus? No, but a few do. In Michael Moore's 2002 documentary, Bowling for Columbine, Marilyn Manson responds to these remarks, countering that the one thing that was ultimately responsible was the media. There was no reason to be afraid of these things, other than the fact that we were being told to. The president was shooting bombs overseas, yet I'm a bad guy because I've, I've sang some rock and roll songs. Nobody said, well, maybe the president had an influence on this violent behavior. No, because that's, that's not the way the media wants to take it and spin and turn it into fear. Because then you're watching television, you're watching the news, you're being pumped full of fear. There's floods, there's AIDS, there's murder. Cut to commercial, buy the Acura, buy the Colgate. If you have bad breath, they're not going to talk to you. If you got pimples, the girl's not going to fuck you. And it's just this, it's a campaign of fear and consumption. And that's what I think that it's all based on, is the whole idea that keep everyone afraid and they'll consume. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really right. as simple as it can be boiled down to. Right. If you were to talk directly to the, to the kids at Columbine or the people in that community, what, what, would, what would you say to them if they were here right now? I wouldn't say a single word to them. I would listen to what they have to say. And that's what no one did. Hey, what are you guys doing? Just get the fuck out of here and don't come back. This heavy shit's going. What are you doing? The United States was now officially entering a new era that would encompass the early years of the new millennium. An era which kept an eye on entertainment, gun control, and adolescent influence and behavior. Columbine engulfed these three factors and created the worst case scenario for Americans. And as a result, became a cultural phenomenon. The event took the terrifying hypothetical outcomes to political issues that were periodically discussed throughout the decade and turned them into reality. It notified the world that people had too much control. Exponential advancements in technology, such as the advent of the internet and astronomical amounts of access to the world, gave the new generation more opportunity than ever before. Opportunity to do both the good and the bad. It was now much easier to make significant contributions to the world, but also much easier to cause significant devastation and havoc. The world was in their hands, even for the people who shouldn't have had it. Starting a debate that was never officially resolved. Although Columbine gave the world much more cynicism in some areas, it also gave it a sense of acknowledgement to their surroundings and a desire to take action in something that was arguably ignored for a long time. It was a calling to inspire change, to do the best we can to pursue a life in harmony, to love one another, to make the world a better place. Josh and Gabe, who go away. Josh, what's with the banana? Briefly, Daniel, what are you about to do? Go to France. <laughs> uh, go to France. Is that all?